Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. He is a student of yet another Yuri, Yuri Matiasevich, who solved one of uh, Hilbert's problems. And I first heard of him from a joint friend, friend of Matiasevich and myself in Paris, that oh, there is this young guy. You, know, you, may not, you may want to know about him. And so then we went, um, when we, then we met in a conference in Russia last September, where he got some prizes. So I invited him. He chose the topic. Uh, it's not exactly my uh, cup of tea, but I didn't mind because it may be close to many people around here. So welcome. And yep. Thank you very much. Um, so this talk is about solving uh, old problems under new assumptions. So it's about new algorithms, but most important, it's about new assumption. So here is the can we, can we delete the, this uh, gray line on the top? Yeah, because... Okay, so this is about four classical algorithmic problems. So first of all, nearest neighbors, then near duplicates, then clustering and navigability design. And these are like informal descriptions. I will repeat them later. So these are old problems, and they are, of course, there are many of algorithms in literature. But the, the problem statements for all these problems in classical settings, starting from something like given endpoints and given distances between them to compute clustering, or to find nearest neighbor, or um, to find all pairs that are close to each other, closer than some threshold. And so it, Either we use some classic model like Euclidean model, so just vectors, vector model, and say Euclidean distance, or we work in abstract general metric space settings, so like some, some metric. But anyway, we assume metric, so we assume triangle inequality. And today we'll talk about how to solve all these problems in the case we don't have triangle inequality. So we don't have triangle inequality, and we don't know the distances itself. So we know much more limited information. So this talk has four parts. First, I will introduce the new model of thinking about these problems and solving them algorithmically. Then I shortly present results. And then I'll show you some details in one proof, and then some directions for further research. So combinatorial pro framework is exactly the, the the way to address these problems without triangle inequality. So it has two components, this framework. So first of all, it's like the new way of representing data, and it's called comparison oracle. Comparison oracle, instead of giving you distances, so the classical like approach is like given two points, it produces you the distance. So there is distance function. There is some domain experts, they design some distance function. So here we assume that domain experts can do much more, much easier tasks. They can just compare two distances between each other. So if there is some object A and there are two other objects B and C, and we just ask which of these objects is closer. So B is closer to A or C is closer. So just compare these two distances. Or similarity. So it might be <coughs> similarity values that does not have triangle inequality. One example is like number of joint friends in social network. So I assume we have a lot of people and we have friendship graph. So who is friend to who? Then we can say that two people are as much similar as the number of joint friends they have. So it doesn't have no, it, there is no triangle inequality. If there is some fixed number of joint friends between A and B and between B and C. We cannot, mm, uh, derive any bound on number of joint friends between A and A. But we can, of course, compare like who has more friends, B with A or C with A. So this we can always. 
So this is like comparison oracle. And we can ask this. So any question to this comparison oracle is a triple. So we ask for three people with indicating who is like, to whom we compare, say, to A. So we compare B to A and C to A. So how many different queries can we ask? That's the question to you. How many different queries can we ask to this oracle? How many different queries can we ask to this comparison oracle if we have n objects? Huh? Yes, n cube. Yeah, so just any triple, right? OK, so uh, good. Now, so I, I described the model when we have less information than in classical sense. Instead of distances, we have just comparative information. So if we have less information, there is no chance to have more, more most stronger results, or even the results we, we have. So I need to balance this. So I'm working in, in comparison, more or comparison model. So I have less information, but I would restrict the class of data sets. Instead of addressing all data sets, I will now introduce a special assumption about data set. And all my algorithms uh, we, we got with co-authors, they hold only in this model only with, for data sets with this assumption. Yeah? Yeah. C may be closer to A than B, but D may be closer to A than B. Okay, so yes, I, I need to say it explicitly. The, the answers of Oracle are transitive. So it is a kind of honest Oracle. So if there, of course, if, yes, that's a good question. So assume we compare to A, and we have three points. So we have B, we have C, and we have D. And if Oracle says that B is closer than C, and C is closer than D, then this oracle will always say that B is closer than D. So the answers of this oracle are transitive. So it's like an honest one. Which diminishes the number of possible. It diminishes the number of possible uh, configuration it can like produce. Yes, but now I will even decrease the number of configuration even more because I will introduce a restriction assumption. So before introducing the assumption, I need to define the notation, which is rank function. So the rank function is the following. We take a particular object, and we sort all other objects using our oracle by their similarity to p. So like the, the most similar one is this one. The second similar one is this one. The third similar one is this one. R is the fourth similar, and so on. So and the notation is rank of object R with respect to object p. And it, it means that it is equal to 4 on this picture. So R is the fourth nearest neighbor to P. You presume there are no ties? Yes. For, for today, I presume that there are no ties. So S has on this picture rank 11, and so on. So the rank of P with respect to P is equal to 0, just to make it consistent. So the, the, the farthest point has rank N minus 1. The point itself has rank 0. And what I would like to have is a kind of triangle inequality for ranks. So if I look at the third rank, so not just rank of R to P and S to P, but also the rank of S to R, I would like to have a kind of lower bound for that, upper, sorry, upper bound for that in terms of these two ranks. So something like if R is one of the best friends to P, and S is one of the best friends to P, then S is one of the best friends to R. This is like informal logic. And formally, this is like notation. So the third rank is no more, then I, I relax it by some constant. Some constant D times two other ranks. So there is not a single way to write this uh, triangle inequality for ranks, there are four different ways. So we, it depends on orientation. So assume I would like to have upper bound on this rank, this point with respect to this point. So I can write it in, say, in this way. So rank of, so say, to be consistent with this, uh, the third rank I'm checking is S to R, right? 
So and there, there is four triangles. So and this is B. I can make bounds through this. I can make bounds. So this slide corresponds to this picture. Uh, there is four ways to write it down. So another way, okay. Mm. Yeah. So in principle, there are four four type of this inequality, and this inequality is called is called disorder inequality. But interesting that from this inequality, if you just make a clever substitution here and take a degenerate triangle, just keep two of these three points equal to each other. Then you get nice inequality that rank function in one side, so rank xy is no more than d rank yx. So if, if one point is like tenth nearest neighbor to another one, then another one would be at most d times 10 to the first one. And that means that, say, sorry? So the definition is the minimal constant d such that it, uh, this inequality is true for all triples. So there is like brute force approach. You like take all triples, compute these two, compute this, divide, and take the maximum. I don't know. Is there, a, uh, is there an upper bound for like fitting system? Um, in general, no. So unfortunately, uh, you cannot say that if you have small dimensional Euclidean space, then this disorder constant d would be small. But say for uni uniformly distributed data sets, it's, it's more or less true. So we prove that uh, we have a lemma that's saying that if you have a, like, a grid, so very, very, like, very uniformly distributed data set, in, say, d-dimensional Euclidean space, then it has disorder constant 2 to the d. Uh, in first glance, it seems like a very bad, like it is exponential. But on the other hand, assume that you have like million-dimensional vectors that lie along the small-dimensional manifold, like the real intrinsic dimension of the data set is much smaller. Then this disorder would behave with, with according, like accordingly to this intrinsic dimension rather than, uh, yes, the general one. So this is, so we, we'll, we'll, we hope that this concept of disorder is capturing the notion of intrinsic dimension, the, the real complexity of data. And the more and more the consistent data is, the more like cluster structure, it has hierarchical structure, the more like objects are grouped to each other in some nice way the better this constant is. So we are trying to catch the, the notion of good data sets, the data sets with some nice structure. And this is the second part of the, the combinatorial framework. So this is like the, the formula. So the combinatorial framework is uh, comparison oracle and disorder inequality. So I just last remark on this. Uh, so since we have this inequality that rank can be reversed with a d factor, if we have just one inequality, we can have three other ones with constant d square. So we can uh, like revert this, this rank or this rank or both, and we have just larger constant. So it doesn't make too much which one of this other inequality we really use. Okay, any questions to this? Because this is really new and it actually generates a lot of questions. There is what? Yes, for all RSP, for all triples of points. And this is characteristic not of the search space but of data set. So in the very same space, there might be a good data set with small d and bad data set with large d. So it's characterized not the space, but the, some particular data set. Can it be divided by data set, data set size then? Can yes, it, it is at most n. Because any rank is at most n. But how does it multiply in dimensionality? Okay, so it's between n, okay, gotcha. Between 1 and n, yeah. 
Well, in some sense, it might be even less than one. Okay. Uh, some why 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 this model is interesting? So first of all, it doesn't require triangle inequality. So we can I will show later that there are nice algorithms for classical problems that can be solved in this model. So assuming disorder inequality and having comparison oracle. Uh, next, it, it can handle the complicated data models. So assume you describe a person in a market like commercial interest of person. So we can describe him by goods he will he purchased and Amazon. We can describe him by uh, advertisements he clicked. We can describe him by his friends. We can describe him by his transactions in uh, MasterCard or Visa or whatever. So there are different features. And some of them are textual, what he searched in, say, live search. Or some of them are graph, like who are his friends. Some of them are time, like what timestamps of his uh, activities. Uh, some of them are geography, like where he lives, and so on. So the, the features are different. So they're numerical, graph, text, time, and so on. And so the similarity function is complicated because it should like somehow uh, address all this. So it's not like Hemming distance. It's not like Euclidean distance. It's something more complicated. And if we and this uh, combinatorial model, it can work basically with anyone because the only operation we require is uh, is direct comparison. We don't do not require any arithmetical operation with similarity values. So we do not divide one by another one or anything. Because if, if we compute something and it has something like the similarity between A and B is 0 0.735384, then what does it mean? Are we sure? Because uh, if we like somehow make some hacks and produce some parameters to tune this, and we got some, and can we think that this particular similarity function is really what God gave us to us? Probably not. It's probably a wrong one. So, but comparative information is a kind of more robust. Another interesting thing is like this local l l sensitivity of local geography. Because assume we talk about like social neighborhood of a person, and for sure, if we take a person in New York or take a person in Kansas, the like the the density of people is different. And the density of features is different. Density of similarity values is different. And we, if we instead of taking like the ball of some radius, we'll take say ball of some rank radius, so something like ball of person and hundred of his nearest neighbors, it will be like self-adjustment of the size of neighborhood. And I will show that a little bit later. So the currently we have one really big drawback. And this big drawback is worst case form of disorder inequality. Right now, we assume that for any triple, this constant d is relatively small. So if it's true only for, but in real case, it might be true for average, that an average third rank is pretty limited in terms of first and second. But it has exceptions. So for some triples, it's wrong. And currently, we don't know how to deal with this. So maybe algorithms will still work. Uh, but uh, at least our proofs that they're correct doesn't work, do not work. But we're working on that, of course. OK, so now just one, I need to introduce one more concept, which is combinatorial ball. And it's very easy, basically. You take a point x, and when you, I take a combinatorial ball of radius 10, it means I take a point and take it nine nearest neighbors, totally 10 points. So at the same time, this thing is radius because we restrict the rank with respect to center. But at the same time, it is volume because it's just number of points that are in this, in this ball. It's a pretty simple thing. And now, this is like, since a lot of algorithms in the classical settings are described in terms of balls, I mean, we are, with my co-authors, we try to do the same algorithms with combinatorial balls. And it was more or less successful. Okay. Now here you bring how stable it is when you change the ball from one state to the next state where more people drop down. 
uh, I would say it's not stable at the same time it's more adjusted adjusting so if the the real data sets is really changing these balls are changing as well so they're like sensitive to changing the data set you have so it at the same time might be at advantage and disadvantage we need to check it we just started some experiments we, we performed just one experiment with all this stuff uh, so the next next notion is combinatorial net in calculus, like first year calculus, there is a notion of epsilon net. Epsilon net is just collection of balls such that they all together cover some set and the centers of which are more or less separated. So epsilon net was something like all centers are epsilon apart from each other and epsilon balls all together cover the whole thing. Here we have the sem similar thing. So we have covering property. Combinatorial balls should cover the whole data set. So assume I take a radius of 100. So I pick few sample people such that if for every person I take the 99 its best friends, then all together these groups will cover the whole data set. And at the same time, I will ask that for any two centers, either in one direction or another direction, the rank is at least 100. And it means that if in one direction it is at least r, in another direction is it is at least r over d, where d is this disorder. So this is the notion of combinatorial nets. And just, just to make you more involved, what is the most obvious algorithm you can think of to construct such a combinatorial net? How you will do this? Huh? OK. And uh, there is an even more simple way. I mean, this is the. You, yeah, I think, I think what you suggest is, is a particular case. So what I'm suggesting is uh, just greedy way, yes? So the greedy way is you take a point, you take its 99 best friends, and you exclude them from the people you, points you need to cover. And then you take any uncovered point, and it has rank to all previous centers at least 100. So it's like separated from previous ones. And then you take a ball around it. And then you exclude all points that are covered right now. Then you take next uncovered one, and so on. And if you take the, the farthest away uncovered, that is just a particular case of what I say. And any. Yeah. And the farthest away is one particular way of taking any. And the second question on the slide asking you, can you prove some upper bound or lower bound on number of centers? So I assume I have n points in general, and I have radius r. r is integer. How, what is the minimal number of centers I need? N over r. Yeah, <laughs> right, n over r, good. Because the, the, the volume of every ball is r. And what is the maximal number of centers I really need? It's a harder question. <laughs> okay, no, there is a better bound. So the better bound is n uh, over r times 2d. That would be enough. And the story is that if you have this combinatorial net, then you can write a smaller ball around, around every center with radius uh, r divided by 2d. This is another combinatorial ball. It's like cores. And these cores are all disjoint. Why? Because assume two centers have intersection with these small balls. So intersection point has uh, so we have two centers. We have uh, these smaller balls, center, uh, cores, and if they intersect, then we have ranks r divided by 2d to both centers. And if we have this, then we have rank here OK, smaller than r divided by 2. Then we have here rank smaller than r by this order inequality. And that's bad because we have separation. Yes? How do you calculate r? No, it's, it's a parameter here. I'm speaking that if we take any particular r and take any particular data set of n points with this order constant d, then we can construct an r net in a greedy fashion such that it has at most n divided by r points 
Uh, at at least. Why yeah. does R come from? How do you calculate R in first place? I don't cal calculate. It's about definition. I'm not speaking about algorithms right now. Okay. It's just definition of R net. So definition of 10 net, of 20 net, or 50 net. <laughs> R is an integer. It's about combinatorial. It's it's not. A, it doesn't relate to distance. It's relate to rank. Okay. So here I say that if I have a, speak about combinatorial net and I have a point in this ball, I mean that its rank to the center of this ball is smaller than R. So if R is ten, then it's within nine best friends of this point. Nine, nine most similar objects. Okay. So. To finish combinatorial framework se uh, section, just discuss the relation between this new concept and other concepts of intrinsic dimension. So first of all, there is a notion called expansion rate of the data set. And the definition is as follows. It was introduced in 2002 by Carger and Rule at MIT. <laughs> and they, they took the following thing. They take for some, for any point P and any radius R, they they take the ball of radius two R. Here it's a metric ball. Okay, so for I'll use notation M B metric ball. So usual distances. They take a ball of radius two R and intersect with our data set and c count the number of points. And then they do the same for metric ball of radius just R. And they take a maximum over all P and R for data set. And this is their expansion rate. So how much, how much more points can we have if we double the radius? And if we have the, for some data set, expansion rate C, then it can be proved that disorder constant is at most C square. And this is a, a kind of nice news for us, because the Kargi rule dimension is uh, defined as log c, log of expansion rate. We can define disorder dimension as like log of our disorder constant. And it is agreed with this Euclidean case when it was 2 to the Euclidean. And here we see that our new disorder dimension is at most two times that Karger rule dimension. So everything that can be proved for Karger rule, so any data set that has Karger rule, small Karger rule also has a small disorder. So we have less restricting assumption. So we can handle more data sets. Yep? Would there be any difference if I change that C to an integer? Uh, OK, there would be some. Uh, then I ha have just C here. OK, I mean, it, it will, OK. In terms of expansion rate, it would be some another polynomial. In terms of uh, uh, dimension, it would be some constant factor. So they all are reduced to each other. And it still holds this uh, relation to to disorder. Okay, and there is another another notion which is mm, less restricting than Karger rule, and it is incomparable with uh, our disorder. So the doubling dimension and disorder dimension are incomparable. There are data sets where doubling dimension is smaller, uh, small, and disorder is large, and other way around. The doubling dimension is defined as follows. They, it also related to epsilon net. So they just ask, if we take a ball of radius 2R, how many balls of radius R we need to cover with it? And this is called a doubling constant. And again, they take a maximum over all balls in the data set. So sometimes uh, the number of balls we need here is small, but disorder constant is large, sometimes other way around. So it, Basically, it is incomparable. But we have actually, we can imply that if we have disorder inequality, then we have a kind of doubling effect, not for initial metric, initial similarities, but for combinatorial balls. So it, it is true that if we have disorder inequality, then the following holds. If we take uh, some ball of some integer radius r, so say 100, then we can pick a limited number of points here, a limited number of say, people, 
And for everyone, we take its 50 best friends, and all together they will cover this 100. And number of them we need is something like d cube. So it's related to disorder. If disorder is small, then number of combinatorial balls of twice smaller radius to cover a big ball is limited. So there is a kind of relation. So it's nice that this new model, which was initially defined as just a kind of relaxed triangle inequality for ranks, has re very clear relation to other concepts of intrinsic dimension. That's a good point for further questions about the model because it's the last slide on, on the model. OK. Uh, so now let me announce results. So first of all, we found a really fast way to construct combinatorial nets. So assume we have n points, and we have uh, disorder constant d. And we would like to build a r net for r equal to n, for r equal to n half, for r equal to quarter of n, and so on. So r net for radius n is just one ball. A point all n minus 1, its nearest neighbors, is just all points. Then we take n half balls of radius, combinatorial radius, n half, and so on. So we have, totally we have log n levels. And it was shown before that if we have these metric nets for this kind of exponentially decreasing radius, then they are very useful. So we find out that we can do the, the same for combinatorial settings. So for technical reasons, we need not just nets, but a lot of pointers. Something like for every ball, we need to keep the list of all members of this ball. And other way around, for every point, to keep the list of all parents, all centers that cover this point, and a lot of other links, but let's not look at this pretty serious. The result is that combinatorial net can be constructed in this time. And this is interesting because it is, in some sense, subquadratic time. That means that we don't uh, actually reconstruct the full similarity order. Similarity order is the following. We pick a point and sort all the rest with respect by similarity to P1, sort all the rest with respect to P2, and so on. So the full information, full similarity order information, the information we can get from Oracle, is this n, n sorted list. And since the working time here is subquadratic, we actually have, we need, we can avoid this full sorting. We can avoid to querying the Oracle about like all triples or reconstruct the full order. Because if we know that, the point is within like the second half of the le least similar point, then we need not to, to, to worry about what kind of position it has. Two million nearest neighbor or three million nearest neighbor. Doesn't matter. It's clear that it is far away. And this is the basic result for the fur all further algorithms because all further algorithms are starting like assume the nets are constructed. Then we do this, this, and this. What is hidden? Uh, so this result is for, at the same time, for constructing for all r equal to n and half and quarter and divided by eight and so on. So it's not it's a time not for construct. Uh, so log n net. Uh, yeah, not just one net, but log n. Yes, ah, okay. but if you give me any particular r, I can also do it in this time. So there is no 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 other dependence on R. So it, this it's it's absolute constant there. Is selecting an R with with R being selected, it could could it be faster? Yeah, I think I can re uh, one of these logs I can uh, replace by log R. So or log n divided by R. So since I need some sortings that depends on uh, R, I can or div dependent on n divided by R. So it would be a little bit faster. Uh, I don't think I can do something with this factor, that, but with this factor a little bit. But still, it's uh, pretty nice because the, assuming, say, d is constant, then it's like almost linear. <laughs> but, I mean, probably not in practice, but at least in theory. 
Okay, so second result, which was initial motivation for us, is nearest neighbor search. And we find that it can be done in preprocessing, so the same formula, it's like combinatorial nets. And the search is d, d to the 4 log n. And this is exact deterministic nearest neighbor. So it's no approximation, because in comparison model, we don't have the concept of approximate solution. Since we don't have values of distances or similarities, we cannot say at most 10% worse than the nearest neighbor, right? So we can, and we just search for a point that has rank one with respect to query, which is nearest neighbor. Yeah, but here, I mean, uh, the, the story is, assume you, you f yes, I can. But if, if I find a point set that has rank at most 10 instead of 1, I know that the best point, which has rank 1, is at most uh, 11D from the point I'm already found. So if I'll just search around the point I just found, I will find the exact solution as well. So if I found a really good, good approximate solution in terms of rank, I can quickly. Yeah, yeah, sure. But if, if we accept the model, then we can do exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so there is two variations of this algorithm. So first of all, we can reduce the, the size of data structure instead of, so we can re kill this factor d and log factor in size of data structure. So the time is still like this of construction, but the size of data structure is just linear. It, it's independent from d and it has no log n factor. And that might be very important for practical reasons. And it has still some poly d log n search. So we push more, more, more work in search phase rather than in keeping everything preprocessed. But still it has like this search and, okay. And another variation is like randomized algorithm. So it is like one side error algorithm. So it either produced the exact nearest neighbor or say, sorry, it was a bad luck. This is my answer, but I'm sure it wasn't, it's not the best answer. I just was make a bad random choices. So it's honest algorithm and it has, instead of d to the 4, just d log n. It has. Uh, okay, so to, to be clear, it has, for any particular delta, uh, the, you can achieve the probability of error at most delta with time, something like d log n log, and here would be some fa delta dependent factor, something like d log delta dependent factor. So if you would like have probability like one over a million, then it would be something like. Three. Yes. And then there would be some factor of maybe 20. So I just to simplify. OK, so the next problem is not, not that known, so I will repeat in details the problem statement. It's called navigability design. And in general, it is assuming we have points and we have some distances or similarities between them. And we would like to construct a, a graph between these points such that every point has limited degrees and we can uh, forward the mess and we know where we are going. So we know what is our target. We start in some point and our way is like to choose, we choose one of the outgoing edges, push the message, push the token, whatever we navigate there. And we uh, would like that every point will Every message will uh, reach the target quickly. So this is the, I try to make it rigorous. So assuming we have n points, we need to design a low degree graph and the rules where to go from any point, such that starting from any point and having some target Q, we will arrive to nearest neighbor of Q in small number of steps. So what we have that assuming these points have small disorder d, uh, we can, in, in the time, again, this, the same time as combinatorial nets, 
we can construct a graph with these degrees such that greedy routine. So we, we, we are in current point. We are going to reach the point Q. We don't know whether the Q is in the graph or not. We just go from the any point. We have like five outgoing edges. So I assume I just traveling from, I don't know, Boston to this room. So first I am staying on the Logan Airport and I'm trying to find how, where to go. So I take the flight which bring me as close as possible. So I take the flight to Seattle Tacoma Airport and then I am again, I need to make a choice. So I decided not to take any, any more flights. I decided to take bus or subway or taxi and then give me somewhere and then I decide maybe to go buy food or, and so on. So every point I make my decision where to go next. And it is possible to design such a graph with this, say, neo logarithmic out degrees, such that the greedy routing, so just every time make a greedy choice, will lead you deterministically to exact nearest neighbor in at most, so this is deterministic guarantee, not it, uh, in uh, expected, but in deterministically in log n steps. It's like very strong guarantee. Yes, if, if Q is not in the net, in the graph, if Q belongs to, to yeah, that will be Q. Okay, the next uh, interesting result is uh, about near duplicates. So assume we have websites and we are going to detect mirrors, the websites that have the same content, something like copy-paste from one page to another one. So assume our comparison oracle has not just comparison between any two similarities, but can also say to us whether the simil particular similarity is above the threshold or below the threshold. And we say, say if two documents are 55% similar, then they are near duplicates. If less than 55, they're probably original ones. And so if we have just this small modification of Oracle, we can first construct the, our combinatorial nets. And then there is a second part, which has complexity polynom from D times the size of output. So it's like output sensitive algorithm. So for every particular near duplicate pair, we need the, the, the amount of work we need to detect it is just some polynom from D. So in some sense, the second part is proportional to, to the size of output. If there are a small number of near duplicates, we will finish the work quickly. If there are a lot of them, then of course we need some more work. Because we cannot prove just subquadratic. So there is an obvious quadratic algorithm, right? We just check every pair and check whether it is below threshold or above, right? So there is, we always try to do something subquadratic. And this is one of the first times we, probably the first time in literature when we have, at least in this model, we have deterministic subquadratic guarantee. So the state of the art approach is the fingerprinting. So they do like, random samples from documents and then they check all pairs that have same fingerprints. It's like random, it's, in this approach randomness is unavoidable when they do this fingerprinting. And here we can construct these nets and then using them deterministically find in some, in this time. The last result is clustering. It's not very strong result but I just tried to do to formalize the problem in combinatorial setting again. So in the usual way, we are trying to minimize the distances within cluster. Either all distances is called k-median, or all distances to the center of cluster it calls uh, k-means. Here, there is combinatorial analog for, say, k-median. So we're trying to minimize all pairwise ranks within the cluster. Just compute the for any pair within one cluster, what is the rank, and sum them up. And the combinatorial nets can provide you with this ugly factor approximate clustering, but almost in one line. So it's probably not the strong result, but at least we can show that the data sets with good disorder can, can be good, relatively well clustered. So there is uh, some implication that if disorder inequality is satisfied, then there is a kind of clusterability property 
for data set. Uh, so approximate, which means that given a data set, uh, we have a lower bound that any clustering will have some lower bound on this expression. And we'll find the clustering with this expression at most this factor larger than this absolute lower bound. And this lower bound actually does not uh, depend from, from data set. It's absolute lower bound. So any data set should have this at least some number. And we will find for any data set with disorder D, we will find the clustering with at most this factor larger ex objective expression. Yes. This is k-medians. Uh, yeah, we can also find the. Uh, can reduce it to the, uh, to the yes, we also can solve, find a um, similar result for k-means. K so for center, for objective function with center, then we'll define a center. I will minimize the ranks. Yeah. Okay. So. Mm, probably I'll try in five minutes give you some hint about one one proof, but not the full one. So just again, uh, uh, we have data sets of endpoints, and we have disorder constant. We have comparison oracle, and we were trying to uh, connect every point with few others such that greedy walk will lead us to nearest neighbor. And Okay, so the requirement and the, the greedy walk is so just some animation. So we start from some point and assuming that the graph is defined, we check all points, all endpoint with comparison oracle to Q and go to the one which is the closest. So in this case, we go to rightmost one. Then we see in the graph the next options and we again we do the greedy. Uh, well, there is two rules. First rule is that, so we have, uh, first of all, we have directed graph. So for every point, we check just outgoing edges. Some edges can be in both directions, that means, but uh, it's easy to see that we not go back because we every time go like improving our position. And if this was an improvement, then this will never be an improvement, right? And we have another rule that if some particular point is better than all its neighbors in the graph, then we stop and say, I don't believe I can improve more, and we report the point. So once we find the local minimum in the graph, we stop and report. And the interesting thing about the graph we constructed, that local minimum is always global minimum. So once we reach the point that, uh, and it's interesting because every point has just logarithmic degree, and once all point, all these endpoints are worse. OK, so here are not worse. But for this point, probably all outgoing uh, endpoints would be worse than this P4. Then we just report P4. And we have a proof for our construction on our model that local minimum is always global minimum. OK, and just one picture how the definition works. So we have all these nets for every scale like n and half and quarter and so on. And we connect every point with <laughs> several nearby centers on every scale. And on every scale, we have this, this rule for connect. And the rule is like the smaller radius you have in your, in your net, the closer you should be in order to be visible. So like we connect every point to to center of every visible ball. And visible ball means that the distance from the center to uh, the current point has some <laughs> proportion to its own radius. So this is visible, this is visible, this is visible. But if we have another ball of small radius but far away, then it is not visible. From the for, not the center, from any particular point. So for any point, we define the its visible Yes, from this point. So for any point P, yes, this is the visibility rule. And yeah, we can prove that this construction has all properties. But I will not show it today. OK, so open problems. 
there was a lot of open problems because it is a new model and it's interesting to study a lot of things here. So first of all, other problems that are defined in terms of distances, it's interesting to consider them in this rank world when we have ranks instead of distances. Second, as I said, the big challenge is to handle exceptions. We will not have that such nice results with exceptions. Maybe we will have approximate results or probabilistic guarantees instead of deterministic, but we we'll hope still have something. It's interesting to study dynamic things, and it's interesting to do implementation and experiments. And in, so what the trick was we started from distances, but we replace these distances with ranks. And the question is, what are other things we can replace distances to have a better property? So this was a kind of regularization of the metric, because new thing, these ranks, they have nice uh, uh, distribution properties. They have one point has rank one, one pro point has rank two, and so on. So they have this nice, there is not like all ranks are equal to each other. So it was like making it more Diversifi diversification of, of distances, in some sense. So I would like to ask a few questions to you. So if you see any potential for applications in what are you doing of these ideas, what do you think it's important to study further? Do you know any references? So I'm around, and I will be very happy to talk with you. I will be here today, tomorrow, and if needed, on Thursday or Friday. And so visit my homepage. I have a special homepage on nearest neighbors and all related to this. Uh, sorry, it's not related. OK, so in particular, the, uh, the tutorial of four lectures with video about nearest neighbors. And here are our papers. So today I presented you combinatorial framework and said some words about results we can achieve in this model. And thank you very much. Okay. The nearest, the neighbor in the ranking. So okay. What distances I may have tied in the ranking? So yeah. So I will be resolving the tie. Yeah. The question is, will the resolved constants depend on how I resolve the tie? Yeah, it seems like it will. Uh, is there any uh, recommendation how I should be resolving the time at least I get a smaller resolved tie? That's a good question. We actually thought about changing the definition instead of resolving ties. But, or just, uh, if we have, say, we have a point, and the distances from points, say, from rank 5 to rank 10 all have the same distances. So for every point, we can uh, define the rank as, I don't know, 5 plus 10 divided by 2, so something, 7 and 5, 7.5. Maybe this way. It seems no fun would be allowed, not too many ties. Yes. They say at most seven. Yes. If, if we have at most constant number of ties at the same time, that is it's OK. But if we have like 100 of them, then it's, we are in trouble. Because then this order constant will actually really expand. Yeah, we are working. It's, it's a kind of question towards these uh, exceptions. It's, because this practice is much, much more noisy than we have in this nice model. Yeah, probably we should change the, the, this you term. Give the positive yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, we probably. We are now thinking instead of saying disorder inequality, saying something like that, just D inequality or distortion inequality. Now, in, in, in the 
examples if you go through way of them. Yeah. So the last bit. Um, so you have two axioms. Yeah. How often are they satisfied or why are they good? So first is not an axiom. is a restriction in the model. It's just, of course, if you can do this similarity or, or comparison oracle in any case. Yeah. So it, it may be not, not only tied, maybe un, undefined. Yeah, partial order. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, we also have this in uh, our extended list of further direction. Yeah, it seems reasonable to, to study this model in, in case of partial order instead of linear order. Well, under noise. Huh? Yeah, if we have this slow sound fraction of noisy. Yeah. So it's how, what would happen to yeah, so this model needs to be uh, made more robust and more. So there, it's just initial proposal. We need to make it more practical, of course. And there is a lot of ways to make it, bring it better. Yeah. Did you play with the second uh, restriction? E instead of D times sum of rank. Yeah. We didn't play in this way, but we are playing with definition in other ways. You want to be compatible to the classical? Yeah, well, right now we are trying to find a concept that generalizes both doubling dimension and our disorder dimension. So trying to find in something which is less restricting than both, but still have nice algorithms. Since we have doing every particular model, maybe there is a joint model when we can do. Yes, so we, we compute disorder constant for one particular data set, namely uh, news articles in Reuters corpus. Uh, yes, and uh, it turns out that for most triples, the constant is really small, like five, but there are exceptions. How many? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't remember, but maybe, I don't know, 3%, 5%. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a silly question. I mean, it's going to say that if I throw out only very small fraction of this, yeah, maybe, maybe it's, a, yeah, yeah, we are going to continue because it was conference version. Now we are working on journal version and we will repeat the experiment in more detailed ways. Do you know if those exceptions have semantic significance of some sort? Yeah, it's also interesting uh, to look at them. In writer's collection, we can do this. Yeah, yeah, I, will should, I will write it. Yeah, thank you.